Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second in our series of webinars on arbitration related topics. Uh, my name is Helen Davis QC, and I'm chairing today. We have three speakers for you. Um, first of all, Jacob Benevitz, who is going to address the circumstances in which the English courts will grant orders to, to secure witness evidence or document production by witnesses in support of arbitrations. Uh, and then Simon Salzado QC, who's going to address the availability of injunctive relief in support of arbitration agreements. And finally, Harry Matavu QC, who is going to cover the public policy issues which arise when the court is being asked to grant an injunction in support of an arbitration agreement, but one of the arbitrating parties is insolvent. Once all three of them have spoken, there will be an opportunity for some questions. There is in the webinar software a questions function. If you have any question as our speakers are speaking, please just type it into that and I will keep an eye on it and make sure your questions get asked. So without further ado, over to Jacob. Thank you, Helen. I propose to cover three topics, all of which are concerned with orders and support as they relate to witnesses. And those topics are firstly, orders to secure the attendance of witnesses under section 43 of the Arbitration Act. Secondly, orders for the taking of evidence of witnesses under section 442A of the Act. And then returning to section 43, very briefly, orders for document production by witnesses. And for each of those topics, I propose to outline the key principles stopping off along the way uh, at anything that's proved controversial or anything that is particularly interesting. Um, and so the first two topics, uh, orders to secure the attendance of witnesses uh, and orders for the taking of evidence of witnesses, uh, those two topics each relate to a shared problem, which is the situation in which there is a witness whose evidence you wish to reduce in arbitral proceedings, but for one reason or another, uh, the tribunal is not capable of compelling the witness to give their evidence. Um, and sections 43 and 442A provide alternative different means, um, different routes of securing the evidence of that witness, although as we will see, uh, each of, of those routes is, is limited in a different way. Um, so to turn first to section 43, um, I've set out this section in full uh, on the PowerPoint slide. Um, just as a preliminary point, um, it's worth noting that Section 43 is a mandatory uh, provision. So Section 4.1 of the Act provides that the mandatory provisions of this Act are listed in Schedule 1 and have effect notwithstanding any agreement to the contrary. Uh, and then Schedule 1 uh, lists this mandatory terms of which Section 43 is one. Um, so against that background, I tend to address four questions regarding um, Section 43, uh, in particular orders to secure the attendance of witnesses uh, under Section 43. Firstly, when is an order under Section 43 available? Secondly, in what circumstances will the court uh, exercise its discretion to grant an order under Section 43? Thirdly, what is the effect of an order under Section 43? And fourthly, uh, very briefly, because it's not hugely interesting, um, what's the procedure? Uh, for, for seeking order under section 43. So turning first to the availability of an order under section 43. Um, so far as concerns the seat of the arbitration, section 43 applies even if the seat of the arbitration is outside England and Wales or Northern Ireland or no seat has been designated or determined. Uh, and that's the direct effect of section 23b of the Act. So far as concerns the venue of the arbitration, the position is, is slightly more nuanced and, and possibly slightly more interesting. Um, section 43.3b provides that an order may only be made under Section 43 if the arbitral proceedings are being conducted in England and Wales, or as the case may be in Northern Ireland. But the first instance decision of Mr Justice Foxton in A and B against C, D and E suggests um, the position might be slightly more nuanced than it initially appears because on, on, on its face that requirement for the arbitral proceedings to be conducted in England and Wales, um, su su suggests that the venue must be in England and Wales. Um, but, but as I say, Mr. Justice Foxon suggests a slightly more, more flexible, more, nu more nuanced position. Um, and in obiter comments at paragraphs 29 and 30 of his judgment, the judge noted that there actually appears to be no authority as to what those, what those words conducted in England and Wales actually mean uh, for the purposes of section 43.3b. Uh, and he went on to make two points uh, about the possible scope of, of that requirement. 
First, uh, the judge said it was generally accepted by commentators that it would include a foreign seated arbitration holding a hearing in England and Wales for the purpose of taking evidence, uh, taking, taking the witness's evidence, um, which is, is, is relatively uncontroversial. But second, more, more adventurously, he said that there was considerable attraction in the argument that a tribunal which sat in New York to hear video evidence from a witness in England in circumstances in which the witness taking the witness's evidence was subject to the tribunal's overall management of the arbitration and the obligations of confidentiality attaching to the arbitration proceedings, that that also would qualify um, as conducting proceedings in England and Wales for the purposes of Section 43 3B. Um, so it seems as if, as I say, the requirement that the arbitral proceedings be conducted in England and Wales may be uh, more flexible, more easily satisfied um, than appears on the face of the provision. Um, so turning then from the location of the arbitration to the location of the witness, uh, an order under section 43 will only be made if the witness is in the United Kingdom, and that's the direct effect of section 43.3a. Finally, moving away from what we might call the geographical issues, uh, it's clear from section 43.2 that an order can only be made uh, if the applicant either has the permission of the tribunal or there's agreement uh, consent between the parties. Um, so much then for the availability of an order under section 43. Um, the next question, as I say, is uh, when will the tribunal exercise its discretion to make that order? So, question of jurisdiction, when can the tribunal make, make the order? Separate question of discretion as to when the tribunal will make the order. Um, and I'll just note two points in this regard. I'll, I'll deal with this question in, in slightly more detail in respect to section 442A uh, in a moment. But section 43, first, in general, um, the witness must be important to the arbitral proceedings. Um, so, for example, in England and Wales Cricket Board uh, against Canaria, Mr Justice Cook decided to exercise his discretion to make an order under section 43 in circumstances where it was common ground that the witness was a central witness whose presence is desirable for justice to be done. So clearly the importance of, of the witness, quite naturally, is going to be important to the exercise of discretion here. Um, the second point to note, um, which I'll return to in respect of 442A, is that section 23 provides <coughs> that in the case of foreign seated arbitrations, the court may refuse to exercise its power under section 43, or indeed section 44, if the fact that the seat of the arbitration is outside England and Wales or Northern Ireland makes it inappropriate to do so. Uh, and as I say, that's a provision I'll return to uh, in respect of section 44. So that covers when orders can be made, when orders will be made. Just very briefly, short questions as to uh, what order will be made and how to seek that order, so procedure. Uh, as to what order will be made, the order will be a witness summons uh, under CPR part 34 and Interestingly enough, possibly, um, a, a witness summons issued under section 43 will engage the court's uh, contempt of court jurisdiction. So if, if a witness fails without reasonable excuse to uh, comply with um, a, a witness summons, um, that witness will, will, will risk uh, being in contempt of court. Uh, as to how to seek such an order, very briefly, um, the procedural requirements are set out in paragraph 7 of practice direction 62. And in short, an application must be made uh, for a witness summons in accordance with part 34. Uh, it must be accompanied by witness evidence, demonstrating that the application uh, is with either the permission of the tribunal uh, or the consent of, of, of all the parties. And I think that's all I'd like to say uh, in respect of section 43. Um, so turning, if I may, to section 44, uh, specifically 442A, um, which might be considered the sister provision to section 43. Um, again, I've set out the relevant parts uh, of that on the slide. Uh, and again, by way of preliminary observation, unlike section 43, which, as discussed, is a mandatory provision, section 442A um, is not a mandatory provision. So the effect of that is that it's open to the parties to make their own arrangements by agreement uh, under section 4.2 of the Act. And this is made doubly clear uh, by the first few words uh, of subsection 1, which provide that the court only has power to make an order unless otherwise agreed by the parties. Um, 
I'm not going to go through all the requirements for an order under section 44 uh, in the interest of time, and because I don't think it'll be particularly interesting. Um, but it's worth, worth focusing, as I say, on a number of issues that have proved controversial. Uh, the first concerns who an order under section 42A can be made against. Uh, and more particularly, until last year, there was something of a conflict of first instance authority uh, as to whether an order under section 44 could be made against a third party, that is to say, a witness who's not a part of the arbitration agreement or, or under the control of a part of the arbitration agreement. Um, Mr. Just Justice Morbick in Commerce and Industry clearly considered that he did have jurisdiction to make an order uh, against a third party, yeah, not a non party arbitration agreement, um, although the contrary was not argued before him, uh, and in the event um, the judge decided not to exercise his discretion to, 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 to make the order. Um, on the other hand, Salon Cockle QC, as she then was, and Mr Justice Mills, uh, as he then was, um, in DTEC Trading and Cruise City respectively, took the view, albeit obviously, um, that orders under Section 44 cannot be made against non-parties, uh, although neither of those cases concerned specifically 442A. Um, but the point was then squarely an issue in A and B and C, D and E, the, the case I mentioned earlier uh, with Mr Justice Fox in the first instance. Um, Mr Justice Foxen felt obliged by the decisions in, in DTEC and Cruise City um, to conclude that an order under Section 442A could not be made against the non-party. Um, but the reservations that the judge expressed in reaching that decision were vindicated um, when the Court of Appeal overturned his decision and held that uh, an order under Section 442A can indeed be made against a non-party arbitration agreement. Um, and, and that is now the, the settled position. The second and closely related issue uh, to the one I've just been discussing concerning, concerning orders against third parties uh, concerns what kind of order can be made under 442A. And a particular issue arose in A and B as to whether 442A permitted an order for the taking of evidence by deposition in support of foreign seated arbitral proceedings. And the respondent in that case argued with some force that this would be surprising because in the parallel regime that applies in respect uh, of foreign court proceedings as opposed to foreign arbitral proceedings, the jurisdiction of the English court to take evidence by way of deposition uh, is circumscribed by the regime governing uh, letters of request. So if the court can make an order for the taking of evidence by deposition from a foreign witness under 442A, uh, the effect is that the court has a more extensive power to support a foreign seated arbitration than it does to support uh, foreign court proceedings. Um, but the Court of Appeal was unmoved by this incongruity, uh, which is variously described as a rough edge or an anomaly uh, in, the judges, judges of, in the judgments of the uh, Lord Justice of Appeal. Um, both Lord Justice Mills and Lord Justice Flo approached the issue essentially as a question, simple question of statutory interpretation, um, where section 44 applies it gives the High Court the same powers it would have as if the proceedings were, were High Court proceedings as opposed to arbitral proceedings. Uh, and in those proceedings, the Court would have the power under CPR 34.8 to take evidence by way of deposition. Uh, and that, in a sense, was, was, was the end of the matter. Um, there does, however, remain some unease about this situation, uh, in which the regime appears to be more favourable to foreign arbitral proceedings than to foreign court proceedings. Excuse me. Um, and indeed, uh, Mrs. Justice Cockrell, uh, speaking extrajudicially in a commercial court seminar, um, spoke, spoke about the, the development of this boutique jurisdiction uh, and described it as distinctly uncomfortable. Um, but, it, but as Mrs. Justice Cockrell uh, acknowledged in the course of that seminar, it may be given the Court of Appeals decision um, that this is now um, a problem, insofar as it is a problem, that requires a legislative solution. Just pausing there, the effect of A and B and C, D and E is that the regime under 442A is remarkably wide-ranging. Um, it seems, in theory at least, that it's possible to obtain an order from the English court for the taking of evidence from a witness who is not part of the arbitration agreement, who is not in the jurisdiction because CPR Rule 62.51b uh, provides that the court may give permission to serve an arbitration claim form out of the jurisdiction if the claim is for an order under Section 44 and to give evidence 
in an arbitration seated in a foreign jurisdiction. So it seems remarkably wide ranging, but of course, um, just because an order can be made under 44.2a doesn't mean it will be made. Um, and turning very briefly again to the exercise of the court's discretion, I would note three points. Um, first, and in relation to foreign arbitrations in particular, <coughs> as I noted earlier, section 2.3 provides uh, expressly that the court may refuse to exercise its power under section 43 if the fact that the uh, arbitration is seated abroad makes it inappropriate to do so. Uh, and indeed, I mentioned earlier that in the um, commerce and industry case, Mr. Justice Morbick um, decided not to exercise his discretion to make an order, and indeed, uh, it, it was on this basis, um, on the basis that the cure law of the arbitration in relation to the status and function of, of evidence taken by way of deposition differed so significantly from that found in this jurisdiction uh, as to justify the decision that the differing procedure on this ground alone makes it inappropriate to make the order now being sought. So that's that consideration being applied uh, in the exercise of the court's discretion. <coughs> and now second, and in relation to foreign witnesses in particular, uh, the court may well take the view that an order appending an outgoing letter of request to the country in which the witness is domic domiciled would be more in keeping with the demands of comity than um, permitting service out uh, of an order directly on, on the witness in, in a foreign country. Uh, and third and more generally, it's not the position that as counsel and AMB sought to submit that an order will only be made if it's necessary for the determination of the arbitration. Uh, instead, as Mr. Justice Mobick held in commerce and industry, uh, the court's discretion, discretion will be exercised on a kind of sliding scale. Um, so the greater the likely inconvenience to the witness, the greater the need to satisfy this, the court that the evidence that, that, that he can give evidence which is necessary for the just determination of the dispute. So it's not, it's not a binary question, it's a kind of a, a sliding scale, as I say. Um, just a very quick word on procedure, uh, very quick in the interest of time and again interest. Uh, an, an application under section 44 is made by way of arbitration claim form uh, and it seems to be important to identify as precisely as possible um, the specific matters on which the witness is required to give evidence. So in A and B for example, um, Mr Justice Foxton indicated that he would, he would not have granted an order in the terms sought because the list of proposed topics which the claimants have indicated that they were last the third defendant about is too broad. Um, so, so keep, keep, keep it precise uh, if possible. Uh, the last topic I'd like to address just very briefly uh, concerns an order for a witness to produce documents under section 43. Uh, now the basic requirements for an order of this type are essentially the same as those for um, an order for the attendance of witness which, which uh, I discussed first. Um, just the key kind of differential point to note in respect uh, of an order for the production of documents uh, is the precision with which documents have to be identified. It's, it's similar to the point I just made in, in respect of uh, Mr Justice Foxton's comments as to whether he would have exercised his discretion A and B. Um, so, so, so the leading case in terms of the precision uh, with which you have to identify documents is Tadjik Aluminium. Uh, and the very short point to remember is that the documents to be produced have to be specifically identified or at least described in some compendious manner that enabled the individual documents falling within the scope of the subpoena uh, to be clearly identified. That's at par paragraph 25, or uh, similar dictum at paragraph 28. Uh, it must be possible to identify the documents to be produced with sufficient certainty to leave no real doubt in the mind of the person to whom the summons is addressed uh, about what he is required to do. Um, so that concludes a whistle-stop tour of uh, court orders in support of arbitrations as far as they relate to witnesses. Uh, and I'll now hand back, I think, to Simon uh, to continue with the seminar. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Jacob. Afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm talking on injunctions in support of arbitration. It's a big topic, small time slot. So I'll just aim to give a quick tour of a few key points. Apologies to anybody for whom that involves um, sucking eggs. Uh, I'm going to say first just a few words about anti-suits. And then other injunctions, including, of course, freezing orders. Um, so first slide, please, Paul. Um, Anti-suits, as many of you will know, within the Brussels regime, anti-suits were forbidden, and it was confirmed in West Tankers that they were forbidden in relation to arbitration as well as litigation. 
Um, there is a debate about whether the recast Brussels might be different as a result of a new recital about the arbitration exception. Um, and that debate was fired by uh, Attorney General Wathelet's opinion in Gazprom, but in Norrie Holdings and Ocrity, Mr. Justice Mayles um, has rejected the idea that it's different. But of course, none of this really matters to us in England anymore. The, best, the, the, the most that might happen to us is we might get readmitted to Lugano, and nobody has suggested that Lugano is different to the original Brussels regime in this regard. So if we do go back into Lugano, then anti-suits in relation to arbitration will be again restricted to um, respondents outside the Brussels area. But for now, that's all irrelevant, and we're in a, uh, a bright and active world where we can get anti-suits against anyone we like. And as far as arbitration is concerned, the key authority on how it all works legally is uh, the case that's last on this slide, um, which uh, maybe I'll call Kamenogorsk, uh, where the parties were party to a London arbitration clause. The respondent had started proceedings in Kazakhstan in breach of the arbitration agreement. Uh, perhaps unusually in cases like this, the claimant had no wish to even start arbitration proceedings. So there was no arbitration on put or even plan, but just wanted to enforce the negative covenant that's implicit in the arbitration agreement that the respondent would not start proceedings somewhere else. And the key holding of the Supreme Court of paragraph 48 was that the court's power to grant an anti-suit injunction to enforce the negative covenant implicit in an arbitration agreement, i.e. to stop the other party proceeding somewhere else, is under Section 37 of the Senior Courts Act and not under any provision of the Arbitration Act. Um, and Lord Vance made clear that that would remain the case even if an arbitration was either proposed or actually on foot. Even so, an anti-suit is uh, now known to be uh, available under the ordinary provision of Section 37 and not any Arbitration Act provision. That, of course, potentially creates a potential difficulty about service out and getting jurisdiction over the respondent. But the Supreme Court resolved that at paragraph 50 by holding that CPR 62.5, which permits service of claims under the Arbitration Act, wherever the seat is in England, also applied to a claim under Section 37 of the Senior Courts Act to enforce an arbitration agreement where the seat would be in England if there was an arbitration. Um, they also held at paragraph 51 that service could be permissible on the basis that the arbitration agreement was a contract governed by English law. Um, so essentially those difficulties were got round. So short point on anti-suit injunctions is that they are available, um, but it's important to check the law if you're looking for one just to make sure you get the basis right because it may not be what you expect. Um, then the next slide please Paul will talk about other injunctions including most notably freezing orders although they're not the only ones. Uh, now you've already seen section 44 um, in the course of Jacob's talk and as I think he mentioned section 44 applies wherever the seat of the arbitration is under section 23b it doesn't matter whether the seat of the arbitration is not in england section 44 applies anyway um, but section 44 unlike section 43 is not a mandatory um, provision of the arbitration act which means it can be limited by the party's agreement indeed section 44 one itself begins um uh, unless otherwise agreed by the parties. Um, and it's not in the schedule referred to in Section 4, so it's not mandatory. Um, now, for such a fundamental provision, that may be surprising, really. Um, and perhaps with that in mind, there's Court of Appeal authority that clear words are needed to exclude Section 44, and that's the SAB Miller case that I've given the reference to on the slide. But Without reference to S.A.B. Miller, although with reference to some of the authorities that lay behind it, in a case called B&S, Mr. Justice Flo held that um, some pretty ordinary Scott and Avery wording, which I've put up on the slide for you, uh, did have the effect of completely ousting Section 44. So this was some wording that was within a, a, a an institutional uh, arbitration rules, uh, 
or, or the, the club arbitration clause within within some institutional rules. And it read, neither party here to, nor party persons claiming under them, shall bring any action or legal proceedings against the other in respect of a dispute, unless the dispute shall first have been heard or determined by the arbitrators on borrow or board. And as I say, that's a fairly standard kind of Scott and Avery clause, but Mr Justice Flo held that it completely excluded Section 44. The counter-argument, which he rejected at length, is that that clause, that wording, was intended to be concerned with the substantive dispute and not with ancillary proceedings such as um, an injunction. Um, but there we are. So that, that's probably an area where there will be further development of the law because it is um, at the moment a little bit uncertain and unsatisfactory. Um, we have the next slide, please. Section 44.4, as you may recall, um, from Jacob's slides, if not anywhere else, says that if, a, if an injunction application is not urgent, then the court can only act with the permission of the tribunal or the consent of the parties. You, you can be fairly sure you won't have the consent of the parties. So the key part of that is the permission of the tribunal. So if it's not urgent, the tribunal has to say that you can go to court. 44.3, if it is urgent, the court may act for the purpose of preserving evidence or assets. And in a very important court of appeal decision back in 2005, despite the typo on my uh, slide, Chetlin and Rouse, um, it, it was held that Section 44.3 is not permissive, but is restrictive. And it has the effect that the only purpose for which a court can grant an injunction in support of arbitration is to preserve evidence or assets. Um, it's not quite as narrow as it sounds, because in the same case, the court confirmed that um, assets includes a contractual right. And that can that can obviously base some fairly broad injunctions. And in that case, uh, there was a mandatory injunction to enforce a contractual right. Nobody has ever, as far as I know, doubted that preserving assets in that context includes a freezing order. Um, though I could perhaps see an argument in principle that it might be something narrower. So uh, anyway, that's important. You have to persuade the court that the injunction is for preserving assets um, uh, um, uh, or evidence. Uh, now, the question then of, of whether the application is urgent within section 44.3, so that you don't need the consent of the tribunal to bring the application, has raised a couple of quite interesting issues in recent years. Um, if we have the next slide, please, Paul. Uh, I'm going to just mention first a case that I was involved in, Gerald Metals and Timmis Trust, in 2016. Um, now, until, I don't know, a few years ago, anyway, certainly until 10 years ago, it would have been very difficult to obtain really urgent relief through most of the arbitral institutions. But that's been changing. And for example, the 2014 LCIA rules introduced provisions, one uh, under 9A, for in a case of exceptional urgency, any party may apply to the LCIA court for the expedited formation of an arbitral tribunal. And under Article 9b, in the case of emergency, any party may apply to the LCIA court for the immediate appointment of a temporary sole arbitrator to conduct emergency proceedings pending the formation or expedited formation of the arbitral tribunal. And that's the emergency arbitrator. Um, now, in 2016, I was instructed by the officers of a professional trust company who acted as trustees of the Timmis Family Trust. The Timmis Trust had given some guarantees of certain obligations owed by um, Mr. Timmis to Gerald Metals. Gerald Metals purported to call on the guarantee and the trust rejected the purported call. The guarantee incorporated LCIA arbitration. So Gerald Metals commenced an arbitration. They tried to persuade the LCIA to appoint an emergency arbitrator to consider an application they wanted to make for a freezing order. The LCIA court refused the application of an emergency arbitrator, giving no reasons for its decision. Um, but in the course of the application for such, my clients had given what turned out to be some very well-judged undertakings. But Gerald Metals then sought an order from the commercial court under section 44, freezing the trust's assets, 
and requiring detailed information about his assets, which of course is very important uh, in a case like that because the assets themselves were the ones that were really at the heart of the dispute. Um, it was submitted on behalf of Gerald Metals that the rubric of section 44, um, the requirement for urgency was satisfied um, because it was a case of urgency and the LCIA was not in a position to act effectively in the required time scale, which is one of the, that's the requirement uh, under section 44.5, which I haven't mentioned yet, but the requirement that um, the tribunal or arbitral institution is not able to act effectively. Um, and they said, well, they can't act effectively quickly enough, um, so the court can. Um, I said in response to that, that the court, that the LCIA did have power to act effectively under Article 9, but had chosen not to exercise those powers. And that fact meant the conditions in Section 44 could not be satisfied. Now, that was met by um, a, a, a fantastically clever lawyer's point that the LCIA's powers were restricted to powers to act in the case of emergency or exceptional urgency. But the court, under Section 44, could act in the case of mere urgency. So it was suggested that there was a, a window of opportunity where it wasn't urgent enough for the LCIA to act, but it was nevertheless urgent enough for the court to act. M Mr. Justice Leggett accepted the submission that that would be an uncommercial and unreasonable reading of the LCIA rules. There was no gap. Exceptional urgency in the LCIA rules is really the same as urgency under Section 44. Um, so because the test was the same, the court had no power to act in a case where the LCIA court had declined to do so. Um, apparently, a little bit to my surprise, that, that decision caused some surprise in the arbitration world. And there's a number of commentaries sort of which were expecting the 2020 LCIA rules to make changes in response. But in event, the relevant changes in Article 9 are quite modest. Um, and they don't really look as if they're likely to make a uh, a, a big difference to the outcome of a case like that. So an important point, the, the, the take home from that is that where arbitral rules do allow the institution to act urgently, as so many of them now do, there may be very little scope for the court to grant a freezing order under Section 44. Um, another interesting issue about urgency arose more recently in BTB commodity trading against Antipinsky where the claimant started an arbitration and the next day went to court for an urgent injunction, which included a freezing order and also in order to comply with some obligations under a contract. The injunction was obtained in the usual way without notice. So the claimant, also in the usual way, had to apply to continue it at a return date. The return date arrived about five months later and the defendant took the point that by that stage, the application to continue was not urgent, so there was no jurisdiction under Section 44. Um, so, so, uh, and um, Lord Justice Phillips, sitting at first instance, held that that was correct and that it wasn't urgent, and so he couldn't continue the injunction. Uh, but he wasn't going to let the respondent off on that technicality, so he used the court's case management powers to adjourn the return date to give the claimant time to obtain an order from the tribunal giving them permission to apply to the court. Um, and the tribunal said that it was not in a position to act effectively um, and therefore it gave permission for the claimant to go to court, um, which was then the position when the court came to consider the return date. But future, future claimants in that position, having got an urgent injunction under Section 44, need to take note of this argument because whether, whether the court will always be as accommodating of a claimant who misses what's now a known point, um, you know, is obviously open to questions. So that's a, a, a matter to watch out for uh, if you are a claimant. Um, I've only mentioned very briefly um, Section 44.5, but I'll just say one more brief word about that, which is not, it's not on the slide, but Section 44.5 provides, in any case, the court shall act only if or to the extent that the arbitral tribunal and any arbitral or other institutional person vested by the parties with power in that regard has no power or is unable for the time being to act effectively. And that's obviously a key provision. I've already referred to it. It's a key provision because it reflects the policy of the act of essentially hands off 
the court only gets involved when absolutely necessary. Um, but I think there are potentially some interesting questions which are not yet fully resolved about what it means for the tribunal or institution to be unable to act effectively. The most obvious case is where the relief is needed with such urgency that the tribunal can't act that quickly or the arbitral institution can't act that quickly. Um, but as I've mentioned, that most obvious case is becoming narrower because so many arbitral institutions are now adopting rules which allow them to act with much greater urgency than before. Um, the second case, which is perhaps more interesting, is that most arbitral tribunals take the view that they would not be willing to entertain any kind of without notice submissions or application. Now, in those circumstances, I think a, an interesting question could arise, whether that means that the tribunal is unable to act effectively, um, or whether that amounts to a, for example, it could amount to an agreement that without notice applications won't be made. So I think, I think there are some um, important arguments perhaps to be had about whether merely being without notice uh, is, um, uh, is, is something which uh, engages Section 44.5. But of course, that will only apply where it's also a case of urgency, because if you want to go without notice, you won't have the agreement of either the tribunal or the other parties, unless you can exceptionally persuade a tribunal to sort of hear a without notice submission that they should at least permit you to go to court. Um, so generally, it will also be a case of urgency. Um, and then the third heading, I think, which could be quite interesting under this, is whether um, it would be sufficient for a claimant to say, well, I need a freezing order which is going to bind third parties. So in the ordinary way, one of the great benefits of a freezing order from the court is that while in form, it is a order that's binding only in personam on the defendant, it also includes provisions that bind anybody within the jurisdiction, such as the defendant's bank, uh, not to assist the defendant in, uh, in overcoming it. So in practice, of course, that means you've frozen the defendant's accounts, at least within the jurisdiction and sometimes uh, further afield. Um, and of course, uh, uh, the effect of a, of a freezing order granted by the arbitral tribunal may well not be, may well not have the same binding effect on third parties. Um, it may be that in practice, a bank would still be quite loath to breach such an order, but it might, that, there's obviously then a difficulty because they've got, um, they've got contractual obligations to their client, the defendant. And whether that would be enough to get you into a position of being able to say that the tribunal can't act effectively, I think could also be an interesting question, which, so far as I know, has not been the subject of any authority. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, I hand over now, I think, to Harry. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me. Um, Thank you, everybody. I'm going to take you into another place. I want to take you into the world of chancery and insolvency. And I can hear the threatening film music. Um, we really shouldn't be knocking on that door uh, at this time. Um, nothing good can come of it. However, as we emerge from lockdown and the economic effects of the pandemic, we've got to face the fact that Substantial disputes may arise in the context of corporate insolvencies domestically and across borders, and insolvency claims may crash in waves onto the shores of arbitration law. And the question is, how are they to be approached? Well, you've heard briefly from Simon uh, about anti-suit injunctions to enforce arbitration agreements. And it's clear that the English courts are avowedly pro-arbitration, and strongly so. That is a powerful public policy. But what happens if one of the parties to an arbitration agreement becomes the subject of insolvency uh, proceedings, and its affairs are taken over by the liquidator appointed by creditors or by the court? Is that liquidator also bound by an arbitration agreement in dealing with disputes and issues which would have fallen within the scope of that agreement in uh, any dispute between the parties prior to the liquidation? And now, of course, 
if an insolvent debtor's contractual or other rights or obligations are assigned to the liquidator, that liquidator is bound. That's not a problem. So if a liquidator is pursuing or defending uh, the position of the company which entered into the arbitration agreement, then he or she must do so by arbitrating. But is that the position of a liquidator in every case? And is the position different if the insolvency is governed by foreign law uh, or by the foreign courts? And the issue isn't straightforward. So if we can look at the next slide, please. We are concerned here with two competing public policies, um, which should take precedence. First of all, you've got the public policy in favor of enforcing uh, private arbitration agreements, as you can see in the quote there, basically, pacta sunt servanda. And against that, one has the public policy in favor of the orderly management of an insolvent estate for the benefit of um, creditors. And it's important when looking at that public policy to recognize that insolvency is a public collective proceeding, whereby a debtor's assets are administered and creditors' claims are processed according to a uniform system of distribution established by law to achieve a fair balance between the needs of the distressed debtor and the rights of all creditors, both vis-a-vis -vis the debtor and uh, amongst themselves. And it is said that therefore such matters should not be arbitrable. And as you can see from that quote on the screen, uh, a quote of Mr. Gary Bourne, the non-arbitrability doctrine rests on the notion that some matters that have so pervasively involved public rights or interests of third parties which are the subject of uniquely governmental authority, that agreements to resolve such disputes by private arbitration shouldn't be given effect. Now, there's a growing body of case law addressing the intersection between those two uh, public policies. And in the very, very limited time available, I can only highlight a couple of cases um, and point to what might be the current state of the law. Now, as we go into this uh, wood a little uh, further, we must note that we're concerned here about claims by a liquidator. Now, what if a liquidator is seeking to set aside a transaction between the parties to an arbitration agreement by exercising a liquidator's statutory rights under insolvency law to challenge the tra uh, transaction as, for example, a transaction at an undervalue? or as a fraudulent or wrongful preference. That's the uh, situation we're concerned with. If we could have the next slide, please. English case law states that such claims by the liquidator are not claims of the company, the company which was party to the arbitration agreement in this case. They are claims by the liquidator who has been appointed to get in the estate of the debtor for the benefit of creditors as a class. And the liquidator exercises those rights and holds any assets recovered on trust for the creditors, not for the company. And you see that in the case there, uh, Reed Baker, which was approved by the Court of Appeal in Oasis Merchandising, cited at the bottom. And if we go to the next slide, please, we shall see uh, Rubin and Euro Finance, where the Supreme Court reminded us of that distinction, saying that in a liquidator's claim for wrongful preference, the purpose of the order for the payment of money to a company in liquidation is not to compensate the company, but to adjust the rights of creditors among themselves in such a way as to eliminate the um, uh, effects of favorable treatments afforded to one or more creditors to the exclusion of others. Now, if that is the nature of a liquidator's claims, then three issues arise. Next slide, please. The first is a question of privity. Is the liquidator pursuing that sort of claim bound by the arbitration agreement when pursuing it? Is he or she a party or privy to the arbitration agreement? 
And the second issue is one of scope. As a matter of construction, is the arbitration clause intended to govern insolvency claims of that nature by the liquidator? And the third question that arises is, if that is the case, is such a claim by the liquidator arbitrable as a matter of public policy? And so let's have a quick look uh, at each of those. First of all, let's look at privity. Next slide, please. If a liquidator is bringing claims uh, in his capacity as a trustee for the creditors, on what principle of privity could he or she be bound by an arbitration clause in such a case? Now, that hasn't been definitively decided. What we have got is a case called River Rock and the International Bank of St. Petersburg decided last year, uh, one of my cases, and it's something of a black swan in the law. It's a, it's a case where I came second. Um, but um, anyway, uh, in an obitus statement, Mr. Justice Foxton, uh, said that there is a case for treating a claim by an administrator or liquidator to set aside a contract containing an arbitration clause as in substance a claim by the insolvent company. Why? Because the administrator or liquidator will generally have supplanted the previous management of the company, which will not retain any power of independent action in relation to the contract in issue. However, he said at the end of that passage, that the question can be left to a case in which it arises. And with respect, um, I think so, because it seems to me, even ignoring the scars that I carry of that case, that this reasoning doesn't, un um, doesn't answer the basic question of contract formation as to how an arbitration clause entered into by a company prior to liquidation can be said to bind a liquidator who is seeking to pursue his or her own post-liquidation claim on behalf of not the company, but the creditors of the company. What do you all think? Uh, it seems to me that whatever result will come when the case is, uh, the issue is finally decided, one can certainly detect, at least in the obiter dictum of Mr. Justice Foxton, a uh, strong pro-arbitration instinct. Then let's look at the next issue that I uh, raised, that of construction. If we could look at the next slide, please. And similar points arise here. Now, as we know, it's firmly established through uh, um, uh, Fiona Trust and Privilog, that arbitration clauses are to be construed in a generous fashion on the assumption that the parties are to be taken to have agreed a one-stop shop for all their disputes. But even if that is the case where we're looking at a claim by an arbitrator to avoid a transaction as a transaction at, a, as an, at an undervalue or a fraudulent or wrongful preference, how can an arbitration clause, I ask, be cogently construed to apply to subsequent post-litigation claims by a liquidator, which are not claims to enforce the contractual or other rights of a company vis-a-vis -vis the contracting party? Again, um, something to think about. And then if we look at the next slide, please, uh, the slide where we are now, if you could go back, please, Paul, the slide where we uh, are there. In Team Y&R Holdings and uh, Gosu, uh, that was a case which concerned an exclusive jurisdiction clause in favour of the English courts and an unfair uh, preference claim was brought in Hong Kong against claimants and a third party. And um, Mr. Lawrence Rabinovitz, QC, held that it was unlikely that contracting parties would have intended to agree to uh, submit to the English courts an unfair prejudice dispute, which was to be determined by the Hong Kong courts in insolvency proceedings there, in respect of which the English courts lacked 
jurisdiction to grant a remedy. And that, it seems to me, makes perfect sense as a matter of, of construction. Well, should the same reasoning not apply to post-liquidation avoidance claims? Why should it be assumed that parties intended that in the event of insolvency, any claims vested in the liquidator to set aside the transaction should also be subject to arbitration? It's not clear. What do you think? And then we move on to the next and perhaps largest uh, point in the least time available, uh, arbitrability. Because even if such claims are prima facie within the scope of an arbitration clause, and it can be said that the liquidator is privy to that clause, in my view questionable, are such claims arbitrable? Put another way, is it right that a private dispute resolution mechanism should govern a claim brought in the public interest in collective insolvency proceedings? And there are four cases which I must take at a canter, um, although we could get into the weeds here. If you could go, Paul, please, to the next slide. Um, the first case is Fulham Football Club and Richards, a case in 2012, where the shareholders of Fulham Football Club, one of the shareholders, presented a petition against the chairman alleging unfair prejudice. And you note that that was not a claim by a liquidator, that was a claim by a shareholder. Uh, and the rules of the club require that all disputes uh, be submitted to arbitration. And so the issue in that case was whether an unfair prejudice petition by a shareholder was arbitrable. And the Court of Appeal said that the question to be considered in such cases was whether the dispute engaged third party rights or whether it represented an attempt to delegate to the arbitrators a matter of public interest which could not be determined within the limitations of a private contractual process. Now, an unfair prejudice petition concerning shareholders in a solvent company, which didn't involve the making of any winding up order, was not the, an application for a class remedy, but rather it was in the nature, the Court of Appeal held, of a private dispute which could readily be uh, decided by an arbitrator. And I get that. Importantly, the Court of Appeal also held that if a claim affected the rights of third parties, there may be a limit to the remedies which arbitrators may give, but that did not of itself render the dispute between the warring parties non-arbitrable. The arbitrators could decide factual issues and uh, where blame lie, lay or fault lay and leave the actual remedy to be decided by a court properly seized. And so the question then arises in our context, could the same be said of a liquidator's claim to set aside a transaction at an undervalue which had previously been entered into by a company or individual? As to that, the Court of Appeal said, Obiter, no, that the powers of a liquidator to do so involved an exercise of statutory power to intervene in and set aside transactions of third parties in the context of the insolvency regime, these, they said, are rights vested in the liquidator for the benefit of creditors as a whole and cannot be overridden by a contract entered into by the company prior to the liquidation. And in doing so, they cited the second uh, case on that slide, the decision of the Singapore Court of Appeal in Larson Oil and Gas. Now, <clears throat> What if the claims in question arise in foreign uh, insolvencies? Uh, there's a recognized public policy that the English courts should assist foreign courts in cross-border insolvency, the principle that's come to be known as the principle of modified universalism in insolvency, and uh, the decision of the Supreme Court in Singular, Singularis and PricewaterhouseCoopers is, is a case in point. And it says that there's a public interest in assisting of foreign courts in insolvency, because the courts of England and Wales have repeatedly recognized not just a right, but also a duty to assist wherever they probably can. So if a foreign company is subject to a foreign insolvency process, and the liquidator uh, brings a claim in foreign insolvency proceedings, which is non-arbitrable under that foreign law, 
Should an English court nevertheless enforce an arbitration clause in relation to such a claim? And we scroll forward as fast as we can then to Norrie Holdings, which was a fraud claim brought in Russia and Cyprus by a defendant bank against a claimant in respect of loan agreements which had been secured by pledges which contained English arbitration agreements. And um, uh, the liquidator of the claimant bank wanted to bring a claim in those courts, uh, alleging that the transactions in question were transactions at an undervalue. It was a wide arbitration clause, all disputes or differences arising under or in connection with the agreement. And Mr. Justice Mail held that an arbitration clause was in sufficiently wide language to be construed as extending to a claim in insolvency proceedings for avoidance of the transaction. And there was no good reason to exclude such a claim from the uh, scope of the arbitration clause. And he said that the dispute was in substance a straightforward factual dispute, which was amenable to determination by arbitration. The arbitrator grant a remedy. And so uh, that was followed in the River Rock case, which I've mentioned by Mr. Justice Foxton, where on the expert evidence of, of Russian law, which was before him, he concluded that the uh, avoidance claim under Russian insolvency law was actually a claim brought on behalf of the company. It wasn't a separate claim by liquidators. And that whatever the position might be in relation to similar claims under English law, therefore, the arbitration clause bites in order to compel the liquidator of the uh, bank, in that case, to argue its dispute uh, through arbitration. And so um, uh, I better stop there in the time available. There are lots of things, more things I can say, but um, I do in recommend that you read the River Rock decision, which is a very interesting one and uh, a very interesting judgment by Mr. Justice Boxton. It couldn't be, it wasn't appealed. Uh, and as a result, the matter is still uh, at large, at least in the Court of Appeal. Um, and so I better stop there in the time available um, to see whether there are any questions. Helen, over to you. Thank you very much, Harry. And thank you, Jacob and Simon. Um, I've just got a couple of questions. Uh, one relating to you, Harry, should we pick that one up first? Uh, the title of your presentation was Arbitration and Insolvency, a Battle for Precedence. But I'm not sure you said who won the battle. You may have given us some indications of your scepticism about some of the answers. But uh, in light of Norrie and River Rock, it would appear that arbitration has won. Is that right? Not necessarily, because uh, I think the current inclination, you, we can say, is that the courts would um, intend, where a company is entered into an arbitration agreement, that any subsequent claim by a liquidator to avoid the underlying transaction should be arbitrated. However, um, as I've mentioned, Norrie and River Rock were cases concerning Russian insolvency proceedings. And in River Rock, Mr. Justice Foxton concluded on that evidence that the Russian avoidance claims were claims on behalf of the company. And, um, but he did leave open the question whether or not avoidance claims in English insolvency proceedings would similarly be um, uh, claims which were amenable to arbitration. And we also have the issue of the first two issues that I mentioned, those of privity and those of construction of the arbitration agreement, which in my view have not been satisfactorily dealt with by the courts. And so if a similar case arises in the future, I would invite anybody listening here to try see whether they can um, bring those particular issues and challenge the court to um, address them fairly and squarely. Uh, if the case allows that. There's just one other point I would make, which is that the decisions I mentioned are decisions of the commercial court. I wonder whether if chancery judges were involved in an arbitration claim of that nature, they would take the same view in insolvency proceedings. Thank you. And then this is uh, the other question I have, I think, is a question for Jacob and indeed Simon. Um, in light of the, it relates to section 44.2 of the Act, 
And in light of the confirmation of the court's appeal in A and B, that, that that provision permits an order against a non-party to an arbitration agreement, are we likely to see a similar development in respect of the other orders available under Section 44 So my sound seems to be causing a problem. I hope you could hear that. Um, so, so both 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 the court of appeal judges who, who gave judgments or justice blood or Ellis as males um, made clear that their decision was, was only meant to be limited to uh, 442A. Um, so, so they left open that question as to whether um, orders under other parts of 442 uh, would, would also be available as against third parties. Um, the, the logic of the decision seems to be that that question will depend, I suppose, on, on whether the particular order would be one that is available against third parties um, if, if the proceedings were not arbitral proceedings, but court proceedings. Um, because the, the kind of basis of the decision is that the jurisdiction under 442 is to make whatever, whatever order the court would be in a position to make uh, if the proceedings were court proceedings rather than arbitration proceedings. Um, so I, I, I suppose that there could be a bit of a patchwork um, in terms of which which of uh, A to E um, are available against third parties and which aren't. So um, E, which concerns an interim injunction or the appointment of a receiver, of course, in general, the court has powers over anybody it likes to issue injunctions. And the, but the, the very controversial limit in this Siskina is that there, that there ought to be some underlying legal right. And so if you had a case where you wanted an injunction against somebody who wasn't a party to the arbitration agreement and it arose in support of the arbitration, um, then you might get into that question as to whether whether you are um well whether the Siskina is actually still has any any real uh extent of operation anymore since it it is it, there have been a number of dicta that suggest the courts are willing to narrow it right down as far as they possibly can um so i suspect that in terms of injunctions uh it probably isn't a problem if the defendant is not a party to the arbitration, um, but I can see that it may well be something that would nevertheless lead to a great deal of debate. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, I think we're just literally coming up, yes, just 1.30, so we'll draw today's um, webinar to an end. Um, we would, of course, all customarily thank our speakers uh, in a rather more vocal and um, noisy way than I can do, but I will thank them all on your behalf. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, the third in our series of arbitration uh, webinars is taking place next Tuesday at 12.30. It relates to the enforcement of arbitration awards, including immunity, fraud and public policy. And we very much hope that we will see many of you there, or well, sadly not see you, but that many of you will join us. Uh, and thank you again for joining us today. Thank you.